So the first question I have for you is to tell you know, myself and other folks who are probably going to watch this a little bit about yourself and what interested you in, in this topic or this area. Sure. I'm, I'm going to start even a little more broadly than, than that, because my, my pathway into law school um, was a little, little unconventional or into law teaching was a little unconventional. Um, when I graduated from, from college, I had this idea that I didn't sufficiently understand the mechanisms that shape the world we're in. And law seemed to me the tool that I needed to study in order to better understand um, uh, what dictates the way things work. And, and, and I was thinking at that level of abstraction, right? I was, I was not thinking as, as concretely um, as, as I do now about statutes and, and, and the frameworks uh, that law creates. And after law school, I practiced for a couple of years, and then, and then I was actually a newspaper reporter for almost a decade before going into law teaching. And, and in law teaching, I found myself gravitating to issues around um, education and educational equity, especially in higher education, um, which meant looking at things like student debt in particular. And every semester that I taught an education law class, there's, there's a portion of time that I'd spend on students with disabilities and the statutory framework for how to treat students with disabilities in the context of schools. Um, and I have wanted to learn more about that. Um, and so that's, that's my, my route into thinking about um, how the law treats people with disabilities. Intersectional is, is actually the, the, the one that I think is more straightforward and then perhaps that, that people are more familiar with, even if disability is the term that, that we use more often. Um, when it, when, when uh, we talk about intersectional, we're talking about different facets of someone's identity. So uh, one facet might be racial identity, another uh, facet might be disability status, right? And so the, the idea that all of us are um, our own nexus of different identity characteristics. So intersectionality, as, as I use it in, in class, is to try to convey this idea that we, we have, we're complicated, we have multiple facets um, uh, confronting the wider world. Disability, uh, we're all along various continua as well. Um, there's a spectrum of, of the human condition, we're all different. Um, so I fall back for purposes of, of, again, my class on the statutory definition and then try to have a conversation with students to identify what, what concerns might we have about the statutory definition. And um, the term disability means with respect to an individual, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities of such individual or a record of such an impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment. So that's that's the definition. And, and, and when we talk about it in class, one of the points that, that, that a student invariably makes is it presumes a, a norm and a, a deviation from the norm, right? That the disability is, is referring to some, uh, some way in which someone differs from uh, a normal person. Um, and, that's why I started by talking about people along a, a continuum. The idea of a normal person um, is an elusive one uh, at best to, to work with. Um, we are all, uh, we're all different. And so to come up with an idea of the norm means we have to, we have to collapse. We have to elide some of those differences to come up with a composite and then say certain differences mark us as um, uh, sufficiently distinct that for purposes of the law, were regarded as, as imp sufficiently impaired, right? So that, such that we are substantially limited in one or more major life activity. Again, the definition in the statute. I think what you're getting at with that question is the way disability status or racial identity 
uh, is treated in the wider world, right? So it's the issue is not so much the way in which the identity marker or the, the thing that makes somebody different from whatever our hypothetical norm is. The real issue is the way in which um, the wider world treats someone because of that perceived characteristic. Um, so thinking about uh, disability status as, as a uh, something that is um, doesn't arise necessarily or directly from whatever condition or uh, nature of the disability, but from how the environment around the person responds. So the, 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 the simple e example is to someone who uses a wheelchair, for example, um, the built environment changes the meaning of using a wheelchair. It's not the wheelchair use of the wheelchair by itself that determines the experience of the person who's using it. Let me say let me say something about the statutory framework for people with with disabilities um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it's it's, it's Title One for those who want to who want to go look. That I'm going to talk about um, the the statutory framework. Um, uh, requires an employer, for example, to provide reasonable accommodations to um, a person with a disability. And the failure to do that um, constitutes a violation of, of the federal law. Um, so uh, a reasonable accommodation can take different forms. Uh, it might be um, modifying the built environment. Again, if, if that's, it might be modifying hours of work, right? Something along those lines. Um, to enable a person with a disability um, to perform the perform the job, this, and this can be complicated, right? What's what's reasonable and what's not. What's intriguing, uh, and and perhaps in some instances, it's certainly in some instances troubling about the statutory framework is it recognizes explicit limits on the obligations of employers to accommodate um, if if it would impose an undue hardship, right? If it would require the employer to do too much. Um, then the obligation to accommodate, uh, then the statute doesn't require the accommodation, right? And, and so the, the question is, is when is um, the accommodation that would enable the person with disability to perform the job? When, when is it asking you too much um, of, an, of an employer? Um, so uh, now, now I have to come back to your question. Um, that's different from um, how the law treats race, right? In, in the sense that there, there isn't a, uh, a similar argument that an employer would make that it would, it would be too expensive to hire someone of a particular racial background, for example, right? That it, it, doesn't, it doesn't figure in the structure. What is the function or purpose of an accommodation in the workplace? So the, the idea of the accommodation in the workplace, right, is to allow an otherwise qualified person with a disability um, to perform the job. And, and the, the statute specifies that other an otherwise qualified person means someone who can do the job with or without the accommodation, right? And, and so the, the assessment um, is to determine what is the, what does the employee need in order to perform the job? What it really shows us, I think, the, the disparities that you're talking about are the ways in which these hierarchies exist overall, right? Implicating our ideas of, of intersectional identity, but they also exist within each like subpopulation that we're looking at. So within the community of, of people with disabilities, race may be more or less salient in certain contexts, right? There might be a hierarchy along lines of race within within that, within that group. Um, likewise, within the Black community, right, there might be hierarchies along lines of ability, ability disability within that community. And, and then there are those who, again, intersectional identity, those who are Black who have disabilities, right, who face disadvantage 
um, along both of those um, dimensions. And, and then, right, there are additional aspects of identity as well, right, that, that, um, uh, that's, that a person might have, right, LGBTQ status, for example, um, uh, in addition to um, disability status and um, um, racial identity. Uh, it's, it's complicated to think about and um, the ways in which all of these aspects of identity are going to simultaneously affect someone's um, opportunity, right, in the employment market. So I don't, I, I don't know that I have an answer for you um, because, I, because I think it's a mistake to try to tease them apart and say, well, I'm gonna deal with each facet of identity separately. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's, I, I think that would be misleading because they are, are working, they're working together in our social interactions, right? It's, it's, it's not as though um, uh, each facet of identity operates independently, even though we're talking about them as, as facets, as though they're separate, right? One here and one here, right? Separate. Um, uh, separate uh, abstractions um, that can be analyzed in isolation. As we think then about disability, you're saying it's, it's difficult to sort of disaggregate them that maybe doesn't do them justice, right? To, to sort of tease them apart. How do you see um, the role? Some of the things that we've actually heard are, how do I know if it's because of my race, right? Because I'm black, or how do I know that it's because of my disability? And in many cases, disabilities, now the majority of them are unseen, they're invisible. Um, so in, in those situations, in those cases, in which we know discrimination is being faced, how do you know individuals sort of make sense of that in employment or in housing when they're saying, well, which one is it? And how do I make sense of the type of discrimination that I may be experiencing as a Black person with a disability? When, so when we talk about this in class, um, this is one of the ways we identify um, perhaps the conceptual limits of the statutory framework that we've got, because it, it doesn't take into account uh, intersectional identity, right? I, I mean, and this is one of Professor Crenshaw's um, um, brilliant insights, right? Was the, this idea that um, uh, there's, it's, there is separate treatment of each facet of, of identity. And there, I mean, in the landmark, um, there's a, a landmark lawsuit in the early 70s before um, or, or roughly contemporaneous with some of the first legislation dealing with um, treatment of people with disabilities in which all of the plaintiffs with disabilities were black and um, the lawyers and, and the trial court judge noted this but made clear that, that that race was not the basis of the decision, which is really interesting if you consider um, the history of exclusion from educational opportunity experienced by Black people, right, in era, eras of, of prior de jure, right, legally manda mandated segregation, um, and then later on, um, the identity a characteristic of having a disability, being a person with a disability. Um, the idea that the plaintiffs uh, counsel, and, and I don't know why they made this decision. I can imagine why they might make this decision to, to focus solely on disability status um, in the course of the litigation, rather than trying to make an argument that, that implicated race. Um, so th this is, an, an I guess, an early recognition of the complexity of um, of identity um, and the, the concrete choices that uh, a, a plaintiff has to make in how to articulate the injury that they've suffered right is it a long is it is it racial discrimination that I've experienced or is it discrimination on the basis of disability um, or is it is it is it both and the, the statutory definition I just read to you that doesn't really um, conceptualize dis conceptualized right discrimination on the basis of multiple uh, subordinating characteristics. How has sort of lack of access to unbiased medical care, particularly in the Black community um, and mental health services, how has that played a role in sort of this disproportional use of, of force? Yeah, there's so much going on in that question. Um, I'm going to 
I'm going to try and take it piece by piece and start with a, a shout out to, to my colleague, Latoya Baldwin-Clark. She wrote a paper um, a couple years ago about correlations between race and um, classification of, of disability status, really kind of parsing the, the bigger the disproportionate overrepresentation and underrepresentation patterns you're alluding to by looking at which classification in particular um, is at issue. So for example, um, there are correlations she found between uh, being black and particular sorts of disabilities that were identified. Um, so black students uh, are disproportionately represented in the population of students with learning disabilities, right? Intellectual disabilities. Um, emotional disturbance, ADD, um, and white students are more likely to be diagnosed as autistic. And this, this matters because the education outcomes, graduation rates, for example, are, are better for students who have autism than for students with some of those other diagnoses that I, that I just listed. So it, it's, it's not just over and under representation of members of particular groups, it's, it's which disability um, they're classified as having um, that makes a difference to the to the, the overall outcome. Um, with respect to policing, um, I, I want to pivot to a different prior publication I'll rely on. And this is the, the report that got a lot of attention in 2016 um, from um, uh, the, the Rutterman Foundation. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, in which they found that a third to a half of people killed by police were people with disabilities. Um, and, and earlier this year, here in, I mean, a few weeks before we're, we're, we, before this conversation we're having, the, the um, LA County Sheriff's deputy shot a 25 year old man with disabilities, um, Latinx, after his family called 911 because he was, um, uh, his condition, his mental health conditioning was, deter was deteriorating. Um, and uh, he may he may never walk again as a result of the incident. He's still alive. And it, these kinds of incidents um, implicate questions about training, right? Training of, of police. How should we respond to situations involving people with disabilities, especially disabilities that, that like you said, may not be visible. Um, and in, it implicates some broader, I'm gonna bring it back to race. It implicates broader questions about, about policing and when should we call the police and for what? And what other resources should we be able to call upon depending on the nature of the crisis um, that we confront? Um, that implicates right, the, the broader hashtag defund conversations that are having now about reallocating both responsibility and resources away from police towards other ways um, to respond to, to crises in the, in the wider community. Um, and suggest the need for the broader development of, of tr tr people trained to respond um, to those situations as they um, as they arise with without lethal force, right? Without lethal force, um, and and of course, uh, intersectional identity is is at play here because person again, person with disability might also be black, might also be Latinx, might also have some other identity characteristic um, that makes it more likely to have an, an interaction with law enforcement. What are some trends that you see sort of in your field, um, whether it's litigation or uh, whether it's research within law, what are some trends that you're sort of starting to see now in relation to disability? And is there sort of a transformation of the understanding because you mentioned, right, students are starting to ask those questions. So what do you foresee in the future for, for this particular field and thinking about disabilities? I, I, don't, I don't know. You know, so my, my education law class, we, we talk about this again in the context of the pandemic. Um, and one of, the, one of the questions I'm very interested in, and somewhat concerned about, but interested to see is, is what, are, what are schools, colleges, and universities going, going to do? in response to students returning to campus after having been through this experience. Um, and will there will there be litigation? There already has been litigation over, over disparities in accessibility of remote learning during, during the pandemic, um, critical of the, the nature of the education provided to students, particularly K-12 students who have disabilities. Um, for whom remote learning is, is might be particularly challenging because of the nature of the disability that they have. 
Um, so those cases are moving forward, and I think those will help to help us to, to see the extent to which courts are, are willing to um, uh, develop some standard for what the obligation of the schools are, but it will be in the context of this public health crisis. Um, so what the what the longer term ramifications will be um, like doctrinally, I'm not I'm not sure. You mentioned uh, K through 12, right, and and litigation that's happened in the K through 12 process. Can you maybe briefly talk a little bit about the difference between K through 12 and higher ed in terms of what's required, um, and then what law applies? Or what are the differences there? Sure. In, in the K-12 context, I'm thinking of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or the IDEA. The IDEA imposes on schools uh, an affirmative obligation to identify students with disabilities um, and then to provide them or provide each with an individualized education um, plan, an individualized education program or IEP um, designed uh, for that student, given that student's disability status. Um, and, and so that's where there, where there's litigation is, is where there's, there's, or often where there's dispute over what the IEP provides, right? So if, if the parents of, of the student um, uh, seek a particular accommodation that, that they believe would be most appropriate for their student and the school um, thinks a different IEP is appropriate to best meet the needs of the, of the student with the disability. Um, so, so that's what I'm thinking of in, in that context. Um, and in the context of, of higher ed, it's accommodations, um, what you were alluding to uh, a few minutes ago already. And in thinking of that then, is there a difference, or what is the difference then in employment um, in terms of protections that individuals can avail themselves of? So, I mean, the employer doesn't have, for example, this affirmative obligation to, to, to seek out um, people with, uh, this is complicated actually. So, so it, employer has a um, set of employees. There's not an obligation on the part of the employer to go out and identify um, which employees that the employer has um, have a disability. So that, that affirmative obligation piece is what makes the IDEA distinct um, from the others. W where it gets complicated, uh, we always talk about this in, in class, where it gets complicated is, is drawing the distinction between um, uh, affirmative obligation and a prohibition on discrimination. Because the, the failure to accommodate can be the manifestation of discrimination, implicating additional statutes, right, that prohibit discrimination. So in, in again, going back to the K-12 context, it may be that the failure to uh, comply with the demands of the IDEA in turn constitutes um, a violation of, of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, even though Section 504 doesn't create the affirmative obligation. And I wanna to touch on, so one of the, one of the main differences, because I'm curious if this is something that will come up in litigation in the higher ed context. Um, which is in K through 12, right? You can modify the program for the individual um, pretty substantially and, and make it uniquely for them so long as they meet the graduation criteria. Um, if not, there's an alternative right, that's provided. Um, in higher ed, and actually in K through 12, we talk a lot about teaching strategies and pedagogy that you can actually change in the curriculum so that the student can meet those demands. In higher ed, there's uh, in cases where, you know, it, it can be that the teaching strategies uh, are part of that uh, accommodation that may need to be modified um, in some cases. And that's usually part of like an essential element assessment, right? Whether or not an accommodation is reasonable. If it's not, there's alternatives and have you try different teaching strategies to meet the accessibility standard for the student. I'm not aware of, and of any uh, cases so far where students have pushed the limit on changing the way in which faculty teach and changing the way in which the university delivers its curriculum. Do you, do you, are you aware of any cases where that, where that is true or do you anticipate as we move along how teaching is changing in higher ed and how education is delivered that that may come up? Yeah, it's such an interesting question because of the difficulty of, of separate, distinguishing, I should say, um, 
the the nature of the accommodation, right? Like having a sign language interpreter. Is that changing the pedagogy the way you're describing? Or is it or is it not, right? Is it is it just a, com a communicative um, uh, a, a, a move to, to promote accessibility that doesn't change the pedagogy? Because um, it, it quickly uh, implicates questions of academic freedom when we're talking about um, how, so this is in the higher ed context that we're talking, but when, when we're talking about um, what and how um, faculty teach. And so uh, I'm unaware of, of a case where uh, a student challenged um, court, like the, I guess, course design, for example, as opposed to the delivery, um, which is not to say that it won't happen and it, it, will, it will be, uh, it'll be an interesting test um, of, of how, how to distinguish, um, I guess, the, the means from the content. Right, or the mode from the content. Yeah, I'm curious how that's going to go in thinking about, you know, because often in the accommodation process, we also compare to other programs, right, to see if those accommodations have been reasonable as a standard. Um, one of the things I think there's more nuance now, I think, to accommodations because most tend to be hidden conditions with, you know, depression is now the leading disability uh, category in, in the US. And within higher education, we find, you know, that's not untrue. It's, it's pretty common that depression, anxiety disorders, mood disorders are the most common. Um, one of the requests I think that are becoming more frequent, maybe in comparison to before, are things like adjusted deadlines, right? Changing deadlines for assignments, also attendance requirements. Um, and students now uh, in the past few years requesting alternatives to being in person. Right, so perhaps the delivery can be an online format. Now with COVID, that's most universities that had to go online. So do you think at some point that's going to be challenged when we go back to some sense of normalcy right. and people are back on campus in the classes and this is sort of what you were talking about earlier with COVID and how we're going to respond to that as a university? You know, do you foresee uh, or, or what do you foresee maybe happening with students requesting to have a remote session when classes are back in person as an accommodation. Yeah. I'm curious to see how institutions, so I, I think what one of the things that the pandemic has done um, is change how these requests are perceived, I mean, to the extent of requests, right? Just to, to change how um, we think about different ways of providing an educational experience. Right and and perforce, we we've all had to, to pivot um, in in what we're what and how we teach to adapt to this 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 medium. Um, so I I don't know. There have been conversations at institutions um, generally about what of this remote modality should we maintain when it's no longer required as a, as a response to a, a health emergency. Um, and I, I don't think, I don't think the decisions have been made at institutions. I, I don't know. Uh, I think logistically a hybrid classroom will prevent, sorry, will, will present certain challenges. Um, if, if some students want to take the class remotely and some students um, want to be in, in the classroom, can we ensure that those experiences are sufficiently uh, comparable, that neither set of its stu students is advantaged or disadvantaged? Um, on the other hand, there are ways in which remote operation uh, has been beneficial to students. I've heard from, from students that there are um, advantages to using Zoom and being able to pose questions in the chat rather than having to raise their hand if, 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 if for whatever reason a student doesn't want to um, speak in front of the full class, now there's a mechanism to participate that's much lower stakes or feels much lower stakes. Um, and and is, is that something we can we can preserve? Um, I don't I don't know. I, I think everyone is kind of feeling out 
what uh, what they want to keep and and what they don't want to keep. I, I to, to more concretely to your question, I do think that because so many institutions have pivoted to providing education uh, remotely, it will be difficult to argue that they can't in the future. Yeah, I think that adjustment, given the fact that we've sort of had to pivot, had to do it, it's going to. But I can foresee that potentially happening in employment as well, right? Because a lot of yeah. a lot of the work became remote, and and oftentimes when employees requested uh, to work remotely as an accommodation in the workplace, had, you know, I'm not so sure that that typically was supported. And yeah. so, and it's been the same thing in higher. It's some, you know, it's going to be interesting. I think for you, how, do you find that that's also going to potentially be litigated or challenged post pandemic? So there, there already have been cases uh, in, in, my, in my class, we looked at a case where uh, an employee didn't want to come back to work during the pandemic, um, even though the employer had taken a number of steps to try to make the workplace safer. And, and the employer said, look, this is not the kind of job that, that you can uh, perform remotely. So, so we've already started to see litigation around um, some of those questions. Any last thoughts, anything of particular interest for you um, in this field? We mentioned sort of, you know, your interest in mar uh, marginalization of communities, both internally and sort of externally. Is there anything we didn't touch upon that you maybe want to maybe want to cover? You you had uh, you had posed to me this this hard question at the end about um, what I'd like to see happen, what I'd like to see change. Um, and uh, and that's a hard question, but 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 I, I thought a little bit about what I want to say. And, and and one thing I would say is more conversations like this, in particular, about about these hierarchies within and across communities of difference. Um, I think I think those conversations are are important. But but more concretely, I think promotion of policies and practices like the ones you're talking about as students return to school or to campus. Um, policies and practices that promote accessibility for students who have disabilities or students who are suffering trauma that that, that, that may not technically manifest or manifest yet um, uh, as a disability for statutory purposes. And fundamentally, um, recognition and response to subordination, whether it's along lines of race or disability status, um, whether it's intentional or not.